Hello, fellow listeners. This is your host, Caleb Miller, and you are listening to InquireCast. This is a podcast designed to inquire into the lives and minds of those individuals who make this world a little more interesting. So please join with me in my lifelong pursuit of always asking questions, inquiring into the interesting people that I meet day to day, and trying to learn more about the ideas and belief systems that these people hold. Thank you for listening. My guest today is Rhett Jackson. Rhett Jackson is the current vice principal of Gunnison Valley High School. Rhett has taught history and financial literacy for 27 years, as well as coaching multiple sports. I found this podcast very interesting as we discussed the school violence epidemic, we discussed history and how we can relate it to today's lessons and what we can learn from it. And I hope that all of my listeners find just as much wisdom and inspiration from what he had to say as I did. Rhett Jackson, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me this afternoon. Oh, it is a pleasure. I'm actually, I'm excited about this one. I, I kept thinking, I'm like, this guy knows so much. He's going to well, blow my mind. Well, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll uh, try not to let you down here. So I... Uh, First off, I have to ask all my guests, even though all of them are from Gunnison. Did you grow up? I did not. I grew up in a, a small southern Utah town uh, right on the Arizona border, Kanab, Utah. Mm. And uh, uh, went to school there and then went to uh, college at uh, Southern Utah University in Cedar. And went back and did my student teaching and helped to uh, assist uh, football coaching with my old high school football coach, who was also my history teacher. And, and uh, kind of wasn't sure about what I really wanted to do. I had a I had an uncle that was a, an FBI agent, a law school graduate, and he was always kind of a hero of mine. So really, starting in junior high, that was kind of the plan. I was going to uh, go get a degree that would facilitate law school, and then I wanted to join the FBI and be an FBI agent. And and that was uh, really all the way up through uh, served my LDS mission in Dallas, Texas, and and uh, so I, my degree was in social studies, or excuse me, social sciences. Because that, uh, but by then I had an older brother who was just older than me that had already got into teaching social studies and coaching uh, high school football. And he'd asked me to help him and I kind of enjoyed it. And then my high school coach kind of found out I was dabbling in it, really invited me to come and help him coach and, and uh, teach and kind of get the ropes. So um, the plan was, is I'd, I just had taken education classes. And so I thought, well, I'm far enough along, I'll, I can go do 10 weeks of student teaching and then walk away with my uh, state certificate. Uh, I still was really leaning towards getting ready to go to Kaplan and get ready for the LSAT. And, but, uh, then I met my, my soon to be wife and, uh, I really enjoyed coaching football and, and working with young people in the social studies. I, I just thought, you know what, this is, this is what I need to do. And so in 1994, when the, the football job came open at Gunnison high school, I applied and, and the rest they say is history. 26 years later. Speaking of history, uh, that's what you taught when I was in high school. So you began with social? I did. So I, I, uh, uh, when I first came to Gunnison Valley High School and, and uh, started teaching, our building was a 7th through 12th building. So I had 7th grade uh, Utah history and then ninth grade geography, 10th grade world history, 11th grade uh, U.S. history, and... Uh, so really, throughout throughout my career, it's it's been a lot of geography, world history, U.S. history, general financial literacy, those types of things. And so, I'm in my seventh year as a high school administrator now. Coached football for 16 years here at our high school. Helped to coach several coaches as an assistant in basketball. I was two years as a head wrestling coach at Kanab High School before I came here. So, kind of dabbled a lot in coaching. Uh, as you can see, I love to work with the youth and uh, mentoring youth and and teaching and trying to be, uh, you know, a professional educator has been a passion of mine. So I, I look forward to our conversation. And, and uh, if I get a little wonky, I apologize. <laughs> oh, you're Because you know me, I can get a little you're wonky. You're good. Um, so I just want to get right into it. Let's With do the, it. Uh, did you see the back to school commercial that was sponsored by the, um, what's the, what's the school that got shot up that's really big? Sandy Hook. I did see that commercial, yes. How do you feel about it? Um, Watching it was kind of uh, depressing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was melancholy. We're in such a sad state of affairs right now, uh, and that this uh, this horror show keeps happening over and over again. 
um, I was actually in the greater Denver area at a football coaching clinic when uh, right after the Columbine shooting in the early, well, mid-90s. You know, it's just uh, for the last 20 years, this, it's just been a recurring nightmare. And uh, the bottom line is it's, uh, it's definitely impacted the psyche of our entire nation. So I, I did a little uh, Wikipedia surfing, just looking at the numbers. Now, I, I wasn't able to find if there were more school shootings, you know, 20, 50 years ago than there are today. Uh, the numbers were all over the place because they would cite any th- if there was a shooting near a school or if someone just brought a gun and there was no shooting. So there's a lot of numbers. But since, so you started teaching in the 90s? 1992. 1992. So since 92 and now 2019, have school shootings become more prevalent? Or do you think it's about the same number? And if, because my, my opinion is whether they're more prevalent or not, there's a bigger media impact here where, you know, kids in the school while it's getting sh- shot up, they can... So this is anecdotal because I haven't really looked at the data, but anecdotally, I would say there are more. Um, And I think that, uh, of course, uh, our acquisition of technology and the ability to to, uh, get information at our fingertips um, and the 24-hour news cycle on cable and and, uh, all of your internet sites. So I think that uh, there are more. Um, I think that the news gets out quicker and we have more access to that kind of information, you know, I grew up in the, in the, uh, you know, as a, as a boy in the seventies and in my hometown, there was during the day, there was one AM station and, uh, it, and in the evening you, you know, or during the day you could usually pick up, uh, maybe a couple of FM stations out of Salt Lake. Um, but there was one AM station, 590 KSUB out of Cedar. And then you had, uh, channel two, channel four, channel five, PBS on channel seven. And that was about it. You know, so it, it just plus your daily newspaper. So the the world that we live in now is gonna, is it's just completely different to uh, d- dynamic than even when I grew up in the '70s and even into the '80s. So when uh, you first got into education, were the like the drills that you had to do for school shootings were what were they like compared to, and how often were they compared to you, you doing them now? When I first started in the early '90s, you didn't have drills for school shootings. And the vast majority of your drills were fire drills. And then every once in a while, uh, uh, you know, once or so a year, which we still do, earthquake drills. Um, believe it or not, when I was a kid in the 70s, every once in a while we'd do, uh, we'd do missile drills. Oh. And because the Cold, Cold War, War was still going on. But uh, after, after the Columbine incident uh, in the mid-90s, uh, in which is, you know, unfortunately, as we talked earlier, just uh, this, this horror show has kind of continued. These and then, and then believe it or not, uh, Caleb, the Breslin school, uh, what's the word, uh, hostage situation in Russia. It was a small rural school, uh, school rural, rural community in Russia when um, some Islamic uh, terrorists took that. Uh, that uh, well, it'd be it, over here. It would have been an elementary school, and so a lot of a lot of data, a lot of things were shared uh, because that that really was uh, such a shocking. Situation. The Columbine was a high school situation, but uh, the Breslin school massacre was a elementary situation, and and how the Russians uh, dealt with it, how we are trying to deal with it. So, really, starting in the '90s, uh, school drilling and emergency uh, preparedness situations have just kind of begin really come into the forefront, and how we how we deal with them actually have changed because we've learned a lot of of how things of tactics that these these terrorists or these uh, really disturbed people who want to kill our youth, uh, they use certain tactics. And uh, whether it's uh, uh, Sandy Hook, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas there in, in Florida, um, and we can get into that if you want, but there, but so the answer to your question is, is, is our, uh, our drills, our rules, uh, what we cover as administrators and as faculty and how we drill that with kids, absolutely it's changed. And I think it's, uh, uh, we've gotten better at it. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, schools aren't still, in many degrees, soft targets. But uh, how we respond to them, I think uh, we're, we're getting better. So just in the small town, and I mean, it's kind of hard in a small town because everybody knows everybody, but mm-hmm. has there been any scares within the last five, six years? 
just for a small town like here? Well, it depends on uh, when you say scares. Uh, yes, uh, in our district, our district, uh, uh, for example, I don't think it's a secret that there was a bomb threat that was called into Manti High School a couple oh, of years ago. I didn't know that. And that's been a, they evacuated their school. And as, as, uh, as a district, that's uh, brought us to the table with law enforcement and, and uh, trying to follow FBI guidelines and how we can be better at those types of things. We have had... Uh, what we would call shelter in place, uh, which is a, a step below, you know, lockdown. Um, but it was uh, a more of a, as an abundance of caution, not necessarily an acute threat. And our our our, uh, our community here in, in Gunnison Valley, for the most part, we've been uh, fortunate. But uh, that doesn't mean that we still uh, don't drill and uh, talk about things with our our teachers and our faculty and staff and uh, obviously our students. And there's certain FBI guidelines and, and uh, state guidelines that we try to follow. Um, so as a educator and, you know, plus you're going to have your individual um, views and opinions. Yeah. What do you think is an antidote to this? Well, um, here again, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a deep and sundry question. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of, uh, responses that I could give, or like I say, are anecdotal. The bottom line is, is that youth, we uh, talked a little bit about this with some coworkers and, and other professionals in education, you know, really the last, uh, uh, for the first 20 years of my career, things were just kind of like autopilot and you kind of knew what to expect and kids, uh, kids responded uh, generally well to just certain norms. Uh, Parents were always, I think, were more supportive of institutions, schools being one of them. Um, those things are uh, changing. Um, and if you look at uh, the role here, again, I don't want to sound like we're piling on because technology is such a blessing, mm -hmm. but uh, it does carry it does carry consequences. And, and here again, a device like an iPad or a phone or what have you, Kindle or... Uh, laptops, uh, just computers in general, smart, uh, smart technology overall. What a blessing it can be, but there are consequences. Uh, you don't necessarily make a bad choice, you know, but there still are consequences to choices. And, and one of those is, is uh, the impact that uh, I think smart technology and uh, just the rise in uh, today, they refer to it as ACE, as adverse childhood experiences. Uh, I think that uh, uh, more and more of our youth come to, into schools specifically with uh, many more challenges than uh, I'd say even when you guys came through and certainly when I came through school. You think that these challenges may, may be something that's um, an antecedent to the increase in school shootings? I, I do. I think that you're, there are a lot of... Uh, students and, and I'll just use youth in general that uh, the data even though I said it's anecdotal there is a lot of data out there that kids are are uh, struggling more at higher levels of stress uh, uh, we are now getting better at uh, understanding the impact that uh, adverse childhood experiences have on many of our youth um, I'll, I'll throw some numbers out here one out of one out of four girls coming into high school age uh, have been uh, have suffered abuse of some sort. Of course, number one that kind of comes to mind is sexual abuse, but uh, there's emotional abuse or physical abuse. One in six boys um, have suffered that type of abuse. Uh, one in five students come to school hungry. So um, I just throw some of that data out there to show that uh, a lot of our kids, they're, they're struggling and they're, they're having to deal with a lot of adversity in many respects that that I'd say uh, younger gen or older generations didn't. That makes me think that, so you, you always hear the argument that we shouldn't let anyone have access to guns and that might, um, you know, decrease the amount of shootings. And obviously, it, it, you know, if you don't have any guns, you don't have any shootings, but um, that, that leads me to what a professor of mine said and she was like, I would be curious to look at the family lives of all of the school shooters because what she had looked into was that the school shooters that she had, only the ones she had looked into came from fatherless homes. And what you're saying is, you know, we have an increase in may, maybe stress levels for incoming students compared to what it was 10, 20, you know, even five years ago. And so I think it's, 
you know, one, we can always address the gun issue, but I think what's something that's really overlooked is the family issue. So in that, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. That, that isn't necessarily the most politically correct thing that a lot of politicians don't like to go to, but I think we can have an honest discussion. When, when um, 40% of, of babies today are being born out of wedlock, uh, in in uh, some of your minority communities, I'll use the uh, in the African American community that number is up to seventy now. When forty nine percent of your marriages are ending in divorce, uh, divorce you know generally uh, let's be honest the, the the children go with the mother, um, and uh, a lot of times dads don't step up in many respects. Uh, so you've got one and two uh, marriages ending in divorce, so that creates single parent families. Then you have even if they co parent, they're they're not together anymore. So there's one piece of data. Then you have in certain, in, like say in the African-American communities, and you have 70% of the children being born with uh, out of wedlock. So there's not even a dad in the, really in the picture. And then that's 40% overall. Uh, those, are, those are some really stark data points that show that uh, children um, aren't getting the same uh, start to that type of nuclear family stability that... Uh, older generations and, and uh, other kids had. And when, so then you have to, as uh, education schools and, and uh, faculty and staff, then you, you, you have to take on a, a bigger role and uh, you have to uh, try and mitigate a lot of that, and, and it's difficult. So, so that led me to a couple thoughts. Um, when Carl was on, Carl Wimmer, mm-hmm. he and I talked about um, what, what like a, a reoccurring theme was or something that a commonality that all troublemaking students had, or, or struggling students, I should say. And he said one of those was coming from a fatherless home. And, but, but then as I'm thinking that, I think, you know, Wimmer, to me, I would go in and, I, you know, I'd skip some classes sometimes. I don't admit that. but um, And I, I would go sit in his office and talk to him and get advice from, from him because at that point my father had left. And so he kind of became a father figure to me. And it's interesting because I've never thought of the role that a, a teacher has to play or, you know, a resource officer like he was. And, you know, you can't really step up and be the father, but there are specific listen, or lessons that need to be taught that they're not getting taught at home. And so I've never thought that, I've never kind of seen it that way that the educator has to figure out how to kind of... Yeah, so um, there was a there was a study, it started clear back in 1985 and... Uh, I'll just I'll do a little name dropping here because I'm, I'm, I'm I, I give the man huge respect. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Vincent Folletti, and uh, he actually was running a, an, uh, an anti obesity clinic in the San Diego, California area in the mid '80s. And uh, he he's he's considered you know one of the now one of the premier childhood uh, trauma experts. And uh, he'll even readily admit he kind of came by it by accident, but he was actually trying to work with people who were coming into his, uh, into his obesity clinic, and they were trying to create a new, a new reality for themselves and lose some weight and trying to find out, you know, okay, uh, why the obesity? Um, is there a medical explanation and, and other, other factors? And, and uh, uh, he talks about how uh, he came across, uh, the lights kind of came on to him that uh, uh, a lot of the people that were coming to him had had some big time uh, traumatic experiences as children and that uh, had caused uh, a lot of uh, uh, their brain to kind of rewire and uh, uh, post-traumatic stress if you will and they kind of turned to food as a way of of self-medicating and that and so then once he figured that out then he went in a completely different uh, direction and now uh, he's the he's kind of the like say considered at least here in the United States one of the the leading experts in childhood trauma and uh, he's kind of the, the the person who kind of came up with this adverse childhood experiences and, and the impact it has on kids and how we can fight it and and one of the things that he came up to like you mentioned is uh, uh, because we've been talking about the nuclear family and and how that uh, that definition in our day has been changed mm-hmm. um, so one of his big things is uh, one of the major strategies that he found in in, uh, in dealing with these uh, these people and trying to help the help them through this was finding a mentor, and so uh, just like you said, your your experience with Officer Wimmer, uh, 
not taking the role of a father, but as a mentor. And that's actually his number one strategy to help youth is, uh, because let's be honest, where, where are these adverse childhood experiences, the vast majority of them happening? They're happening in their home. They're happening with the people closest to them. And that's, that's just part of the data spectrum that we have. So uh, a third party mentor, uh, according to Dr. Felitti, is very, very important. Matter of fact, it's the number one. Uh, he basically lists five strategies, and we don't have to get into all of them, but his number one strategy is a third-party mentor. And for mentoring youth, that they, you know, peer-to-peer relationships are important, but the data is very clear that, uh, that mentoring uh, by an adult is critical in trying to overcome these uh, adverse childhood experiences and trying to alleviate the damage that uh, this trauma and this stress has uh, been in their lives. Uh, he's through his studies. He's actually found that uh, the stress receptors, because of these adverse childhood experiences, actually rewire the brain, so the rest of the brain doesn't develop. As you're talking about finding a mentor, in my I took developmental psychology, and I hope I get the right psychologist. I think it was Vygotsky. Um, he stated something. Came up with something called an MCP. I think it's a more capable partner, or more. I, I think it's what it stands for, but. It's basically like uh, you you find an individual who is already proficient in a field and that person ends up kind of like being your second mentor. Your first mentor should be you know, father and mother, but then this MCP helps you. It comes in and you can have multiple and they can help you in various fields. And so I, I think this could also, it could also be another word for a mentor. But when I, um, so my, my father passed away and while he was, while him and my mom were divorced, it's like I didn't have much of a father figure. And when he died, it was just like I was absent of a father figure at all. And I, I looked and I couldn't, I couldn't I've, I've talked to Wimmer and he was good, but I moved up north and it was just that, that distance. I couldn't really uh, communicate with him all the time and meet with him. And, but uh, there's another psychologist. I, I, I would, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say his name, but. Um, I'll adjust it after the podcast is over, but he was interested in the different spheres of communication and influence. And with the advent of YouTube and social media, where you can literally be in contact with anybody, um, these two psychologists ideas kind of paired together and you can literally find a, a more capable partner or a mentor using YouTube. And that's what I used when, um, you know, after my father passed away. I was aimless. I didn't really have anyone to, you know, keep me in line or like t- to learn from or to ask questions. And I ended up stumbling upon. Um, I-, I don't know if you're familiar with Jordan Peterson, but a lot of a lot absolutely of, Canadian psychologists. Yeah, a lot of gentlemen, brilliant. My my age, kind of same situation, kind of aimless, kind of lost, trying to figure out meaning. And we find him, and it's really interesting because you don't need to sit down with someone in person to find a mentor you can find a mentor online and you know, they don't even have to ever meet you, but you can learn from them. And that for me, finding a mentor, finding a a more capable partner that can guide me through finding what meaning is and being an individual and being respectful and humble. That is when I began to really grow. And before I discovered him, I mean, I was really um, neurotic, had a lot of bad thoughts, um, had some bad behaviors. It, it was because I was aimless, but once I incorporated this mentor into my life, I mean, I started dropping this, started picking up the good habits, started to actually do something for myself. Well, um, it's interesting because uh, I'm a big Jordan Peterson fan too, um, and and we talked earlier in our discussion where he's he's just a couple of clicks away, and you can spend all day listening to him, oh, yeah. and uh, he, and uh, you can browse uh, his uh, and listen to his expertise in clinical psychology. And I, he is, he's brilliant. And, and the, the thing I uh, appreciate about him is he's able to articulate it in a way that, at least for me, it's, it's easy to understand. But uh, so that's, that's a, one of the benefits of technology is that uh, you're right. Uh, these, these mentors are out there and, they're, and, and we can access them, shall we say, even through a, th- a third party, our, our, like technology. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I think it's a little bit sad, you know, it, it, took, a, uh, it took a social uh, uh, confrontation of, uh, up in Canada where he took a stand uh, over uh, because he had uh, uh, some transgender students and, and uh, his, uh, his higher-ups and even I think the Canadian government was trying to tweak with, how, with G- 
gender neutral pronouns and he yeah. just he took he became famous because he just took a stand for free speech and uh, anyway it's just interesting how uh, and now uh, he's he's world famous and and rightfully so he's uh, he's brilliant and I, I I'm glad you found him we, we talked about are you talking about uh, childhood trauma and, um, and I guess before we move on to that I would yeah I think I would like to, to state that any listener that is finding themselves thinking like, oh, wow, I really don't have a mentor. I really don't have, you know, whether it's an adult, you know, typically it'll be an adult because they have more life experience, or an older adult because they have more life experience. But I, I would highly recommend that you, you know, not even if it's not even Jordan Peterson, but YouTube is such a vast place that you can find so many positive, influential speakers and individuals who can mentor you through any of your life problems. If you can find someone like that, or multiple of them. I mean, that helped me so much. I think that if someone finds himself in that position, it would be good for them. Yeah. Um, also, uh, you know, for many of our listeners, maybe they've, they've already listened to Ted talks. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good information that's disseminated through those. Um, you mentioned YouTube, um, and, uh, they're out there. Um, it, it, it leads us kind of, kind of back to what we were talking about. Uh, a lot of the data has found that is that people, to to combat uh, adverse childhood experiences or adolescent trauma or even trauma as youth, as we grow and develop, that to to make it to simplify this is we need there really are three spaces uh, as you move in from uh, adolescence into adulthood. There's three spaces. There's usually your home space, a workspace, and uh, what they found is that people that are that are emotionally and healthy and uh, are highly contributing to society have a, a, a positive third space. And most of the data shows that if you have two of those three, that, uh, you know, that that will create productivity and emotional health. Now, it used to be, you know, in our, in our nation that uh, for many, many Americans, uh, in America for many, many years was always considered the most religious country in the world. And so our churches be, were, for many Americans, through most of our history was that third space. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had your, your home life. And of course, uh, home life was dictated generally through uh, religious principles and uh, modeled uh, through the church um, and uh, the Bible. Uh, Judeo-Christian principles, ethics, if you will. So what we're also s seeing now is that uh, America, even though compared to Europe, it's still much more religious than Europe, but uh, the religiosity, the, that third space is uh, narrowing. Mm -hmm. And so people are going to have to find, uh, and I'm, you know, this podcast isn't about advocating for any specific, but it's just that people are going to have to find it. It might be as, it might be as innocuous as Starbucks, okay? Uh, interesting little data point when when uh, when Schultz, uh, he he was running for the Democratic nomination. I think he's dropped out now, or either out or he was an independent. He was the CEO of Starbucks and really brought Starbucks into fame. And everybody thought Starbucks was great. And, and uh, when he left, they kind of changed a little bit of their of their marketing ploy. Uh, it's interesting that uh, their market share started to fall, and uh, places like Dunkin' Donuts, Winchell's. Other uh, uh, lower cost, quick in and out. Get your pastry. Get your uh, uh, your cup of Joe in a plastic cup or a paper cup. They were eating into um, Starbucks uh, market share, and so Starbucks and they they kind of kind of panic, and uh, by now Schultz is kind of gone. So they kind of they started picking his brain, and they started uh, doing you know some reverse figuring out, and and it it sounds innocuous, but. What they found, believe it or not, is, and they've, I believe they're uh, re starting to redo it, is they found, as they started to talk to their customers and everything, why, uh, why customers were kind of stopped coming, is uh, customers were willing to, to uh, come by Starbucks and have a pastry and have their coffee. But what they're finding out is not necessarily that their coffee or their pastries were any better than Winchell's or Dunkin' Donuts, but that their, their pastry was on a porcelain dish. And their coffee was in a porcelain coffee cup. And something as innocuous as that, going just that extra mile, creating, and so people would stay and linger and enjoy drinking that coffee out of that porcelain, an actual coffee cup and an actual nice uh, Danish dish, rather than just, and once, once Starbucks did away with that, then their people thought, well, wait a minute. And then, and then if you notice, uh, they also 
they had some people who were lingering and then they booted them out. They say, hey, you got to leave. You're, you've been here too long. So, and, so Starbucks was a, yeah, one so, of those areas. So they're dying out. So it, it, it might be as, it might be like, say, it might be as innocuous, innocuous as where you can go get a cup of coffee and, but just have a place that makes you feel relaxed and safe and wanted and special and just how they, uh, you know, Chick-fil-A. I mean, they're the, number, <laughs> they're the number one fast food restaurant in America now. And don't get me wrong. Uh, I think their chicken sandwich is superior to anybody else, but, <laughs> but, but, when did you ever actually think that a chicken sandwich would overtake a hamburger? Um, but if you go to Chick-fil-A, it's a different experience. So you stated that the, the third um, area, the, the zone or whatever it was. Third it space. Was, third space was slowly narrowing, and it used to be religion. And this is something that Peterson's talked about. And he mentioned a uh, philosoph. It's a story, but it's kind of like a philosoph- philosophical narrative about Faust. I don't know if you're familiar with that, yeah. but... Um, about how, and he relates it to the Columbine shooters, that life, um, life is so terrible that it would be better not to exist at all, or, or being is so terrible that it would be better not to have been at all. I think he says it, uh, which is gonna, gonna lead into, I think our next topic is, one, you get, you become nihilistic like that, and you have no other zones, and, you know, it, not only just your religious er- areas narrowing, but your family's narrowing. Uh, maybe even your friend zones are, are narrowing, and that can lead to you know nihilistic behavior, you know where you have no hope, no meaning, and that's where you you know see your school shooters. But further than that, and you know just equally as terrible, you end up with students and individuals who feel that life is so meaningless that they don't want to be here at all. Now, when I was in high school, I don't think we had a single suicide, and I don't think we had one until maybe one or two years after I had graduated. But then we had one, then we had another, and the town up the road had another, and then it was just boom, yeah. boom, right back to back to back to back. So when you talk about, uh, kind of what we're talking about are these, these you know, spaces that create norms and, uh, and positivity and uh, comfort and health, for schools, the challenge is, all right, so we just ran the data by kids with adverse childhood experiences, uh, kids who've come with some sort of assault or abuse um, or hungry. And so it's really hard now. Now, then the challenge for especially a public school is oh, we've got to take everybody as they are and try to figure out how to get them better. And uh, that becomes a really challenge. Let's say in our high school, you come with 320 separate uh culture value systems and you have to try and here again take kids as they are and improve them and that's that's why really for most educators it's a it's a calling as much as it is a profession but the challenge that you have then is it uh, if 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 the foundation right it's kind of like maslow right abraham maslow's hierarchy mm-hmm. of needs the, you know he has those hierarchies and another one is you know taking care of food and shelter and 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 safety um, you know, the number one thing then is schools are, we strive to be and try to be our safe spaces and not so much that, uh, by safe space, I don't mean where kids can't be challenged, but you can't even consider learning if you're as a student, if you're, if you're coming and you're afraid. Now, if you're afraid that, uh, you know, let's say maybe you and you feel safe while you're at school, but school's out at three o'clock and you got to go home. Um, so th- there's that, that recurring challenge that schools have, uh, then say, uh, you know, then having a love and belonging and you have to, we have to get back. That's why uh, our military is, is, I think, revered and respected in, in many, uh, throughout most of our country, uh, because they give something for people to belong to that's bigger than themselves. And as, as schools, we have to try and do that. Uh, whether it's, uh, we tried that through extracurricular activities and clubs, uh, mentoring and you know, teachers then they have to uh, not only do they have to dispense content but they really have to be uh, reflective practitioners of how they teach soft skills model those looking for kids who may have issues and be that mentor as well as say science and English and math but uh, this is where social media exacerbates it is that when they go home um, and the data is also clear that every time a, a dean goes off on your phone, your stress receptors kick in. And even as adults, I mean, if I get a text, I'm in the other room and I know it's my phone. 
I'll be honest with you, I, 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 have to, I have to take a deep breath. Okay, do I really need to go answer that? Mm-hmm. But what they're finding in the, in the teenage brain, the adolescent brain, is that, that that's, a, that's an overwhelming stress response. And we're, the average uh, American adolescent is having hundreds of those every day. So whether, and they don't really even realize it, but that when there's a notification or a text or uh, a ding on their phone, whether it's a Facebook upload or an Instagram um, uh, or a snap, um, the, the stress receptor goes on. And they're finding that it's multiplied greatly for the adolescent brain. And so they have stress. Many of them have stress at home. Many of them uh, have technology that uh, is always with them. And so the amount of, of uh, stress and dopamine that's going, uh, stress uh, hormones, um, I said dopamine, but it's not. It's cortisol. Uh, cor- cortisol, thank you. Uh, it just has an impact long term. And that's where the, like I say, we talk about third spaces and schools for adolescents, we need to be, uh, you know, it needs to be home and school. And then within the school, we have to try and find, create a third space. Mm-hmm. And now whether here again, if that's extracurricular activities, uh, uh, clubs. And so uh, the bottom line is like, even at our, our own school, I mean, we're, we've now started feeding breakfast. We're, we're, we basically tell our teachers, hey, if a kid brings some uh, breakfast into your room, please let them eat it. Uh, we're also have many, many students on free and reduced lunch. And so we're trying to become that third space. And, and that's a challenge because for, for here again, I mentioned earlier in our podcast, for 20 years, I didn't really have to worry about that. There things that were just autopilot. But uh, I think our, uh, our music departments and any type of a club, our STEM clubs, um, like your, uh, your science and technology clubs. Those are, those are important. We're, we've started a coding club for, um, your sports and, and just trying to, trying to increase that net to grab more kids and create that third space. But it is, it's awfully difficult to overcome home. So with all of these preventative actions, and I, I assume this is going to be a, uh, a, a very delicate line to walk, but how do you go about after a suicide? Because I, so there was a town, so Richfield, they had one a couple of years back and the school was just silent on it. And I think it was one of their first ones. And, and then um, I think it was the same thing for Gunnison, like the first or second one they had. It's just like, how do you react to this? And now it's, I think this most recent one, they painted that, uh, the parking lot for the student. How has how administration kind of adapted to handling that compared to what they were used to, you know, five years ago? Well, f- the first off is the the when uh, someone takes their life, it in a way it is uh, uncharted waters because each one's unique. Yes. Uh, so uh, you're right. It's uh, it's 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 not. We're not a, necessarily a lagging indicator anymore. Uh, Utah, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, as a state overall, we've had. Uh, our share and their uh, uh, science is, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out some people uh, wonder if eva- elevation has something to do with it. Um, so I think the number one thing is you try to, you try to reach out to uh, your students overall in general. And here again, create, create safety, uh, create mentorship. Uh, you bring in as many professionals as you possibly can for a rural community. Uh, give kids all the freedom if they need to talk and they need to they need to uh, visit uh, or if they just need someone to, to give them a hug. Uh, so it, it I don't know that to be honest with you, Caleb. I don't know that you can necessarily just say you know the boom 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 boom. This you know you go step one, step two, yeah. step three, and because they like say each one is uh, unfortunately is, we're all unique. We all have unique challenges and and uh, they're not all the same. None of them are the same actually. And so you. Uh, you try to you try to meet the needs of your students as they come. So mental health professionals um, uh, talking about it, but uh, it's a it's a challenge. I, uh, I I look at suicides and they're all so young. And I I was a little reckless and somewhat suicidal when I was younger. And you know, even after my girlfriend and father, um, that was probably the worst when I really contemplated it. And I mean, I was only 20 years old there, you know, still young. And, but these kids are, aren't even 18 yet, most of them. Yeah, it's and, the number one. Oh, sorry to cut you oh, off. I was going to say it's uh, suicide and car wrecks uh, for, I believe it's 14 to 19-year-olds are the number one uh, cause of death now 
here again, each one, you know, you don't want to be cookie cutter with, uh, with this subject. Uh, everybody's each is unique individual, but, uh, here again is as you move forward and you try to, uh, you try to stem the tide. I think we can come back to some of the other things we've talked about is, uh, you know, the nuclear family, in my opinion, is the number one insurance policy. Now, is it, is it going to fix everything? No, because there, there's no, there's not going to be an answer to human choice. Um, but if the, if, uh, children and as they move through adolescence have that uh, have that loving safe space the safe space of home and uh, have good relationships both with mother and father um, that would be huge you can't dissect these subjects from some of the data that we're talking about when Mm -hmm. when uh, you think about four out of ten kids are being born and there's no marriage contract there's no there's no commitment between biological father, biological mother, that's four out of 10. And in some communities, in minority communities, in the African-American community, like we mentioned, it's up to 70. And then you add on that one out of two marriages is failing. Um, trying to get these two of the three spaces, it's really hard when when at the, you know, your communities are only, your neighborhoods is only as good as your homes. Homes make good neighborhoods, neighborhoods make good communities, counties, states, and, and in a car, our case, republic. So, uh, the role as a school is to try and, and try and be that third space. These kids are so young, and which as I was talking about, and it's it's sad because at that age you don't really know what the rest of life has for you. I mean, I'm I'm 24, and the things that have happened to me just in the last year, like it's it's more than what happened to me in all of my four years of high school, you know, to to certain extents, and. I think these high school kids get these, you know, out of these three zones, they have maybe one that's okay, then one that's really bad, and one that, then the other one doesn't exist. And they were born in it, they were raised up in it, and they're currently living in it in high school. And in that, you know, in that mindset, they think this is it. This is all life is. And it's like once you get out of high school, like you don't realize how you know life has its stresses, but these kids don't even have freedom yet. Right, and so because they because one they 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 have limited life experience, uh, and we here again the data is pretty clear that the adolescent brain is still just you know the neural pathways and the growth and development the maturity of the brain. Uh, most all the data says that it's an ongoing process until you're at least twenty five. So it's uh, you're right. They get uh, they and most teenagers uh, looking past uh, you know looking towards the weekend is about as far as, you know, as far as they get. And that's okay, but that's the role of, that's why uh, we mentioned those third, third parties, third spaces, third parties. Uh, you would, you would hope that parents um, could do that and, and always modeling and talking to their kids about hey, looking forward and uh, the big picture and that high school is only four, you know, it's four short years yeah. and that uh, life this isn't the way it's always going to be. As a matter of fact, you know, you're going to look back eight, ten years from now, and, and high school is going to seem, um, you're going to be wondering, why did I get so stressed out about it? So, yeah. but, uh, you know, they say, you know, good leaders make choices and look at the years. And so kids need leadership, and uh, the best leadership they can get is in the home with mom and dad. But it's uh, your social institutions, uh, your religious institutions can help with that. I would say that, you know, to along the lines of all that is whether you're a freshman in high school or a se- you're starting your senior year, um, life does change dramatically after you graduate high school. And whether it's going to college, to a tech school, you know, moving out of your hometown or staying in your hometown and, you know, beginning work and having much more freedom, that one or four years of struggling that you're going to have to go through high school and that one or four years or even if you're in middle school whether it be six years of waiting and until you're you know your own free individual and you can make your own choices that is a blink of an eye compared to the 60 plus years that some of these kids are given up it's like i look back i've only been out of high school for six years and i look back and it was just a flash like yeah. it, it was yeah. it was some of the funnest most like stressful times in my life, but in, in the big picture, like you look back and like, wow, that like a lot of like 90% of that didn't mean anything. Right. So 
one of the things is in as you come up through the education process is what it really means to learn and to be, to 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 be educated and and learn it. Uh, of course, skill development is is a big part of that, but uh, there's a there's you know a, a formula that when they talk about what really is learning and and uh, uh, because a lot of what let's be honest a lot of what we learn. <clears throat> matter of fact, just the other day I was in a in a, in a classroom helping out a teacher, and uh, a lot of what we learn learning has to be a lifelong process, and uh, and so. Um, I was talking to uh, the students, and uh, and I told them, you know, I took uh, I took a college computer science class at SUU in 1991, and so you can just imagine how much uh, information that I was that I took in that, and that was a college class. It's it is so out of date. It is so obsolete. Um, what kids kids now in 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 a high school class. They are so much the, the knowledge and the and the abilities that they have now, uh, compared to what I did in 1991. So a lot of what you learn throughout your life will become obsolete. That's why learning has to be a lifetime, a lifetime value and a lifetime exercise. And that uh, that through learning, uh, this is now here's my just my opinion. Uh, you create hope, and you create uh, those habits that uh, allow you to take that learning and it's like if you're constantly learning then and if you if you work at being a good communicator uh, and being able to to work with other people and be a team player and give yourself to something bigger than yourself and uh, and you're not afraid to learn and communicate and be a critical thinker and you know because you're is kids move and I tell them uh, whenever I, I get a chance to go to a few of the financial literacy classes because I taught those for years and years and I, I love those classes and they teach a lot of soft skills that kids need as they step into adulthood is y- you're only you're only going to be paid and compensated for the problems you can solve mm-hmm. so if the only problem you can solve is is uh, getting the french fries out of the oil then that's what your compensation is going to be so part of being a lifelong learner is is figuring out how to solve problems, the big problems, the small problems, and uh, a lot of times you you can solve those problems better as a team than as an individual, and that's where communication comes into it. But but uh, problem solving and uh, good communication, and then having the willingness to continue to learn throughout your life that will set you up because here again I'm I'm a firm believer you're only you're only compensated in this life. Uh, basically for what you can problem solve. And I think uh, compensation wouldn't necessarily just be monetary. I no. think I think when we look at our own lives, uh, just in my own experiences, if I'm unhappy, my happiness, I'm, I'm going to get compensated in happiness for what I am willing to, what problems I'm willing to solve in my own life. Sure. It's like, so I'm unhappy, well, am I drinking? How much sleep am I getting? How much time am I setting, doing absolutely nothing but watching TV? Um, and am I willing to change those things? And if I actually put in the work, then the happiness, you, then you begin, to, you begin to get the happiness. Yeah, so problems arise. Problems arise in all facets of our life, professionally, uh, in our personal relationships. Uh, and some of the hardest ones that we have to overcome are the ones that are closest to us because we're emotionally invested. But uh, so your problem solving uh, is it's a lifelong pursuit of, across, across our lives. Um, I tell students a lot of times is, uh, it's just a, uh, it's interesting, you know, uh, Benjamin Bloom was one who came up with a taxonomy of a higher order thinking to get, throw, get a little wonky with you with education. Simply how you phrase questions, fire different parts of the brain and, uh, uh, Bloom's taxonomy of higher order thinking. Uh, he, he, he basically created a whole set of, uh, of, uh, question prompts that force kids or anybody for that matter to, to think critically. In other words, uh, asking somebody, oh, what was the date of Pearl Harbor? Well, that's a, that's a, just a knowledge or a knowledge question. You either wrote memory, uh, if you remember December 7th, 1941, uh, versus, um, uh, compare and contrast, uh, you know, the United States Republic, uh, and their, their worldview versus the Japanese empire. We're now, now we're getting into an analytical just by, this by the prompt. And so what I would say is, is 
for for all of us, and especially with kids, is instead of asking, can I, why don't you ask yourself, am I? Mm. And uh, because if that, just the, the change of can and am, changes the whole dynamic of whatever situation that you're in. And uh, it forces you to, to write, then be present. And uh, where can kind of creates a little bit of fear and doubt in a, in a, of a future. And uh, the future is simply made up of, of, of our present and moving forward. So I like, uh, I like to phrase that, with, uh, especially with students, just instead of, like I say, instead of talking about can I, uh, am I? That, that is well said. That, that struck a chord in me. That's good. Um, I want to segue, if that's okay, okay with you. I took, it was ninth grade history from you. I think, or maybe it was 10th grade history. It was sophomore year, yeah. It would have been sophomore year. Sophomore and junior, I believe. I, I talked to, uh, so I had Scott Jackson on here, uh-huh. my other Jackson boy, and uh, you guys aren't related, are you? Nope. Two different, two different Jacksons. Uh, I believe his dad came out of Idaho. Ah. Um, I, I'm supposed to thank you because, I don't know if you listened to that podcast or not, but I said that, you know, in Gunnison High School, there was a handful of quality teachers that really knew the subject material and really cared that so, the students learned it. And when I look back at my history class, like I love that class. Like you really knew your stuff. So I wanted to thank you. Ah, you're welcome. And um, I also wanted to talk history. Let's do it. So you taught, let's see if I have a good memory here. You just, you said like 30 minutes ago, but you taught world history, uh-huh. United States history, yep. and then just regular geography. Yeah, so freshman geography, and then uh, sophomore uh, world history, and then junior uh, US history, and then senior general financial literacy. For about the last mm, 18 years so before I went into administration. What area of history, like what time is your favorite and you favorite area of history? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so I I don't know that I, w- I could say my favorite because I uh, in each of the so the the word history comes from Greek uh, uh, Historia, which means to write. So history really uh, starts with the rise of civilization. And uh, there are five factors in civilization um, that, that have to be in place for a group of people to be considered civilized. And the very last one of those five, and we could get into those if you'd like, but the, the very last one of those five to be put in place uh, was writing, a system of writing. So uh, I'll give you the other four. Um, Can I guess? Yeah, to do it. Let's which, see if you remember. Which one is Starbucks? <laughs> well, they, I don't know. They, they, uh, they had beer back then, so maybe they had coffee. Uh, I, I honestly wouldn't. Be, I could take a guess. I would say, so the, the fifth one was writing. Mm-hmm. I would say you got to have agriculture. So, uh, so many of them were practicing agriculture, but this is, this is uh, as, a, as a group model that all, fi- uh, that all five uh, factors were in place with people. So the, the one is uh, a division of labor. Okay. Can't all be doing the same thing because if we're all out hunting and gathering, that, that, uh, that, that won't cut it. We've already talked about writing. That was the last one to be put in place. The Sumerians did that in 3200 BC uh, uh, with a system of writing known as cuneiform. And so you have to have a division of labor. You, uh, you have to have uh, a, a system of worship uh, and a, a system of government, and and within those, you have to have you have to have a system of worship and a, and and government because, in order to be civilized, you need to have a a a moral a moral support and a legal support. And morality and legality aren't the same thing. And I think for a lot of kids, they they uh, you know their lights kind of going. Oh wait, wait a minute. And there's lots of things. Let's look at our. Our country, there's lots of things that are legal, but millions of people think they're immoral. So, in in the sense of like a totalitarian nation, um, like Nazi Germany, they, and I think maybe even the USSR, didn't they abolish the idea of God and religion? Yeah. So, so uh, um, one of the founding principles of, of you know, starting with Marx, but uh, really, of course, the the Soviet Union was was the was the brainchild of, of Vladimir Lenin, mm-hmm. 
and uh, his followers. And so, so the the thing is, is that uh, they want the, the state to be the worshipped entity. The state is your god, and uh, they want to take they want to take personal conscience out of the equation, um, so that uh, if people um, well, we can get a little wonky here. Uh, Lord Moulton, uh, and anybody of our listeners in here, if you want to, if you want to have some interesting reading, uh, just Google Lord Moulton. Uh, it was a, a, a British, uh, will probably be the uh, similar to what our Supreme Court justices would be, and uh, <clears throat> he uh, wrote a, a treatise, and he called it uh, the that uh, here back, back to the third space that you have anarchy on one side and then you have complete, utter, uh, no choice, complete, uh, utter uh, legal uh, control. Um, and then he talks about this space in the middle and he called it the obedience to the unenforceable. So uh, that's where morality kicks in. For example, um, when the Titanic sh- sunk, uh, the the casualty rate uh, there was many 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 more men who drowned than women, and the reason being is is that there was this obedience to the unenforceable. There was no uh, it was mass chaos, and so uh, but the men out of out of uh, chivalry or what have you their their moral code, ladies first into the lifeboats, and so that I just use that as an example. So morality creates that. Uh, that's that that extra space between complete legal uh, bondage, uh, like you would li- live in, say, communism. Now, communism is is a more of a of a economic enterprise, but uh, they 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 couch that with totalitarianism, where you have no freedom and you don't have you're not allowed to have a conscience, versus anarchy, which uh, you know we don't see uh, as much uh, anymore, but. Uh, morality creates that uh, that extra space where people have a sense of value and important things that they will obey even when they're unenforceable. So, uh, back to world history, mm-hmm. uh, you can't you can't have. It's, to me, it's domino effect. You can't have and start talking about the others, other civilizations without starting with the Sumerians. Okay, the Sumerians give us time. The Sumerians give us first number system. Um, based on 60, which I always thought was interesting. They give us the will. They give us writing. Um, and so uh, they, to me, are, they're very fascinating. Of course, uh, we, uh, we can't really get to the Greeks uh, without, and here again, a lot of these are, are simultaneous, but uh, when you have the Sumerians in the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley, you have the, the Egyptians in the Nile, and what the Egyptians were will, able to do. And... Uh, and on and their concepts, so and then of course the Greeks and the Romans. I I like the Greeks and the Romans because for us as where we're sitting here in uh, the United States, um, the Greeks are the ones who t- t- for the for the first time decide you know what power to the people. We don't want kings, and they create a very it's a rudimentary form of democracy. It's a direct democracy based on your city. Your city was your state, and so your first allegiance was to allegiance was to your city. And uh, they allowed the, the citizens of that city to have equal say and uh, um, begin what uh, many people call a direct democracy. But uh, uh, the Athenians then come up with a constitution soon, soon thereafter. Uh, the Romans borrowed, right, cultural diffusion. Is the, diffusion is a, a remarkable concept that humans have. But you don't get the Roman Republic without Greek democracy. And the Roman Republic then, they take the best of uh, most of the city-states, but uh, primarily Athens and Sparta, and they blend it together. Um, Our founding fathers didn't dream up three branches of equal government. That was done in the city-state of Sparta by a man by the name of Lycurgus. Um, Our founding fathers, uh, you know, they don't come up with uh, a articles of a constitution. The first constitution was actually written in Athens many, many, you know, 450, 500 B.C. So you can't really have us without studying them. So it's, it's, uh, it's remarkable. The Romans then take uh, the concepts from uh, the city-states of Athens and Sparta and kind of tweak it into their own because they eventually, when they overthrew the, the Etruscans, and they, they didn't want a king. And so, but they didn't really want to do a direct democracy, so they went with what's called a republic. So the Roman Republic, about 
500 BC. And then for, guess what was the next republic, the second republic, the United States of America. 1787 was when the Constitution, I believe, was ratified. So you go from like 500 or so BC all the way. Of course, they, they eventually lost it. And uh, a little segue there, uh, Alexander Tyler, who was a great uh, political scientist in England, he, he, he studied republics and democracies, and he said they had shelf lives of about 450 years. And then they collapse, and they then are replaced by uh, totalitarianism. You, so it's kind of a scary thought, but when you, but sure enough, what did the Romans couldn't, the Greeks lost theirs. The Romans eventually lost theirs and then Julius Caesar, and then they go for another 500, you know, some odd years of uh, emperors. So uh, our founding fathers learned from history and put, put in place what is the most beautiful republic with constitutional protections against government overreach and everything else. And, and yet it's, it's interesting, uh, uh, when they, the founding fathers walked out after the, the Constitutional Convention and, and someone uh, uh, was reported to come up to Franklin and said, what do we have here, sir? And he says, you have a republic and a democracy if you can keep it. And so, uh, and of course, Washington, many of our founding fathers said, you, you can't have all of these rights without God-fearing uh, personal responsibility. And uh, so when you get into American history, oh, the founding of this nation is, to me, the most fascinating and the most fulfilling. Um, I just got through reading a book uh, called Founded and uh, Forged in Faith by a uh, uh, last name of Gregg. And he basically puts this book together and bases it on how, how our country was founded and how the colonists uh, uh, from Europe came here and how much uh, the Judeo-Christian ethic uh, played a part in the formation and the founding of our great country and the the values that uh, that we have. Now we're a nation now of fifty states with three hundred and what thirty five million people, and and uh, uh, we've become you know the melting pot of the world. And you can come here and be an American and be from anywhere. But uh, the Judeo Christian ethic is is has been the the foundation of our nation. And how that came about is, is truly a miracle. So I, I love uh, teaching about that. Um, I love and respect Abraham Lincoln, uh, what he did to save the republic um, in its darkest hour and uh, what he went through personally. And let's even take him as assassination off the table. He basically uh, watched his wife um, and I can imagine her helplessness watching his stress and, and how, um, you know, the Civil War was uh, this idea that it was, you know, a foregone conclusion. That's just not true. Um, and the stress that he went through, she, she literally uh, had a nervous breakdown and she basically uh, lost her, you know, her emotional and neurological edge. And he had to take care of her. One of his sons gets sick, sick and dies in the middle of the war. And so to me, if I could just throw out one thing to our listeners, the, uh, the battle for Atlanta in 1864, and put yourself in Lincoln's position, you know, he, he has a commander, a uh, commanding general <clears throat> by the name of uh, McClellan, and uh, the Union Army got spanked at uh, Bull Run, the, the Southerners call it, at uh, Manassas, first Manassas, and this is uh, 15, 20 miles from D.C., so we're, we're not, I mean, you can hear the cannons, and as a matter of fact, they say all the all of the uppity ups from Washington say, oh, there's going to be a fight. Well, let's get in our carriages and let's go have some afternoon entertainment. And of course, uh, uh, the Union Army was, was uh, decisively defeated and they all come screaming back across the Potomac bridges and, and, uh, and uh, Washington, you know, everybody was afraid D.C. was going to be under siege. And so he, he has McClellan, he puts McClellan in charge. Well, McClellan, McClellan was really good at, at organizing and raising this large army, but he was his ability to 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 fight kinetic warfare, he just wasn't very good at it. And uh, the, the Southern generals were just far superior. And so eventually uh, uh, he makes some serious uh, poor decisions and uh, uh, Lincoln replaces him. And uh, Lincoln replaces several of them before he finally finds Grant, who, who is a great kinetic uh, warfare uh, uh, soldier general. Well, McClellan runs against Lincoln for the 18, in 1864 for the for the presidency, and uh, he he basically runs on a platform, elect me, and I'll, I'll end the war. So you think if you're in Lincoln's position and the war's not going very good and hundreds, I mean, we lost a generation of men, uh, 600, almost 700,000 Americans were killed in that war. 
and uh, you know you think of World War Two and Vietnam and and World War One. I. I mean, and we lost more in the in the Civil War than all of our other wars combined. And then to have the guy that you replaced now running against you and leading you in the polls, and it, it kind of came down to the battle for Atlanta, and finally Sherman, uh, General Sherman, and the Union Army finally uh, broke through at Atlanta and and saved uh, saved Lincoln's presidency, and uh, he went on to win re-election. And I really feel bad. The worst thing that really could have happened for the South and for the healing of our nation was uh, the assassination of Lincoln by Booth. So those are those are fantastic. Uh, uh, World War One, I, I think, is one of the the least studied. Um, it shaped the 20th century. If you want to know the 20th century, you have no further to look than uh, World War One. Can we uh, can we jump back to what you said with so it's Franklin that said you could keep the if, if you can keep it can keep it. And then you've uh, you've mentioned several times the kind of the re- religious, moral, mm-hmm. ethical narrowing of the country. Would you would you point to that as a po- possible cause of why the republic might fail? So yes, because if you're a nation of laws, okay, and when it kind of comes back to what uh, Lord Moulton talked about, uh, without without uh, religious morality. All right. And of course, uh, you know, here again, our founding on Judeo-Christian principles, but any uh, religious morality that helps shape because it's our it's our morals that will shape our laws. And so um, and it's our morals that that create that trust between human beings and our value system. And uh, so, for example, it's it, uh, you know, what other country has a Second Amendment? I mean, think about it. What other industrialized country trusts their citizenry to to be fully armed? And and what other set of founding men? Uh, you look at the founding fathers in their in the Federalist Papers and in their own writings. Uh, it was Washington himself who said that uh, the citizens should have every uh, right to every weapon and as, not, as and the amount of ammunition that uh, armies have. And, uh, of course, we don't quite go that far in the 1930s. We took, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the name of that act, but, uh, you know, fully automatic weapons. Um, you know, we don't sell them, and really those, the ATF tries to keep them off the, the shelf. Do you think that's a good thing? Um, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a libertarian that way. Um, I, can see the, I can see the wisdom in that, but I, 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 I'm one of those that uh, I don't, I don't trust politicians very much. It's I, I feel like I have a pretty good understanding because of my history background of human nature, and uh, it's polit- it's not politicians that give us our freedoms. All right, uh, John Locke was a, uh, and many of the philosophers of the Enlightenment that our founding fathers not only did they study history but they studied philosophy. And Locke, of course, the, a big uh, natural rights philosopher, basically said that uh, natural law. Uh, as human beings, our rights are derived, and Jefferson quotes Locke many, many times in the in our in uh, the Declaration of Independence, and uh, that our rights are, we're endowed by our Creator. So our rights as human beings come from God, not from government. It's mm-hmm. government's job to protect our rights, not give us rights. So politicians don't give us rights. Now they have this they have this need, many of them, to try and take it away because human nature, uh, the power is a very very intoxicating combination. So um, uh, I, I use the Second Amendment because I'm, uh, you know, it's, that's important to me. But all of our rights, you know, the number one right, the, the First Amendment actually has five rights. And a lot of times people don't remember oh, that. Can I guess those ones too? Let's go. Let's see. see what you freedom got. of speech, free, freedom of press, assembly. Um, so, so I got, I got, you got three of them. Oh, I'm missing two. So I got press, assembly, speech. Um, oh, there's two more I don't know. What are they? So the very first right is is basically your right of conscience, that, that uh, the, the government will not get in the religious business, that uh, they'll make no law establishing uh, religion, and then they put a semicolon, all right? That's the establishment clause, and then they put a semicolon because that's a complete thought, and then it says, nor prohibit the three ex- free exercise thereof. So uh, that, and that's the first right, all right? You, you mentioned press and uh, uh, assembly and uh, uh, speech, and those are, all, those are all important. But isn't it interesting that the founders put our, our basically our right of conscience mm. first? 
Uh, and then the, the fifth one is the right to uh, petition your government for a redress of grievances. So uh, you have those five that are couched in the First Amendment. And then, of course, it, I find it to me, they just, this was done on purpose. Then the Second Amendment is right, the right to keep and bear arms. <clears throat> Do you think if uh, the Founding Fathers were able to take a, uh, get, get a time machine, go to the 21st century and see the um, capacity that we have as humans to make weapons that we do. Do you think they would still make that decision? The, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a hypothetical. Yes, definitely. But uh, uh, I think it's all relative. So for their time, uh, a Kentucky rifle or a brown best musket, um, the, the frontiersmen or the, the basic colonists, when, when the Minutemen met on Lexington Green, uh, met the uh, the British uh, regulars and the Grenadiers, both were basically armed with the same weapon. Hmm. So uh, I think uh, now they're not a monolithic group, uh, the founding fathers, but uh, I'd say the majority of them would uh, would would say you know it's it's your right to have uh, to have whatever uh, technological advances. It's it's still that right, and the and the the basic right that's based in this in the Second Amendment. Is self defense. You, you mentioned Locke, and I think Locke came up with the tabula rasa. I think it's a blank slate. Mm -hmm. I think it's. I, I don't know if I'm correct or not. Do you know that? Uh, that tabula rasa sounds maybe a little more French to me, but so but uh, may, maybe it's not Locke. But I, I I'm I would bet three dollars it is. So, but he that idea is that. Um, so we're, are you familiar with the blank slate mm -hmm. kind of philosophy that we're all born? Yes clean and then throughout our nature experience, and nurture yeah throughout ex, you know throughout our experiences we learn um i'm not i mean I, I own firearms i own plenty of firearms i don't necessarily think that i mean I, I think it's a tool for violence i think anything could be used as a tool for violence some are just more efficient than others but i'm also a strong believer in for the most part tabula rasa where our experiences growing up what what our culture and what our society teaches us really influence how we behave and and who we identify as. Mm -hmm. And I think if, um, I think if we were all raised in a society where guns weren't kind of romanticized and violence wasn't romanticized and we came, we grew up with these three zones of what, what, what three zones of what are they called exactly? Well, they're basically, uh, not really called anything that they're, they're just zones of, of health yes. and of security and of growth and development. So if I think if we had, you know, positive zones like that, and if, you know, we had stable families, then I don't necessarily think in my personal opinion that the tool is the issue. Um, and you're always going to have your outliers. You're always yeah. going to have, yeah. you know, people who are born just with something wired wrong. But when, when I look at violence and I look at the gun issue, the Second Amendment Second Amendment issue, it's like this isn't a gun problem. This is a person problem. This is someone who has experienced so much trauma that they have that, that, that philosophy that Faust had. It's like, I'm just going to inflict as much damage as I possibly can. It's like if you would have put that tool, and, you know, even replace the gun, make it a knife, make it a samurai sword, make it a hammer. If you have someone with that mentality that I'm going to go cause as much harm as I possibly can, they're going to cause harm. Yeah, and they'll use the tool that causes the most harm, which is why, back to kind of what uh, Franklin said, if you can keep it, you can't, you can't uh, separate rights from personal responsibility. But you also can't take away rights uh, based on trauma and error and uh, uh, emotion. Um, and he... Uh, you can YouTube this. He was a, a returned soldier, and I think uh, it was certainly isn't politically correct, but it's something that uh, uh, registered with me. Um, he was speaking before a city council. I think there was a, a city ordinance uh, that would limit the, the Second Amendment, and uh, they had the citizen dialogue. and He stood up and said, "I'm a you know I'm a returned uh, uh, veteran, and I've fought for this country." And uh, he basically said. Uh, your dead does not trump my right. And uh, it was very stark and very blunt. But uh, our rights are not, our rights, if you believe in natural law, come from a higher plane than humanity. And what it then is 
for us to do. And this is why I think history is one of the most important subjects that could be taught. And I love all, you know, I love, it, you know, math is important and English is important, but I, I love the social sciences and history, especially because you, this is where you can uh, learn from the past and try to self-correct for the future. Uh, that um, if we believe our rights come from a higher power or a higher plane than humanity, then it's incumbent upon us to work together and, and be united and to have uh, a, a similar level of morality. And that, that then will create legality that's, that's fair and that we can all live with. But more importantly, it creates that space, like Lord Moulton talked, talked about, the obedience to the unenforceable and that we value each other. And, uh, well, and then in the Judeo-Christian ethic, right? The first two great commandments in the law, right? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, that, if everybody, you know, practiced those types of ethics, uh, then uh, as written in uh, Deuteronomy and then re, uh, re-emphasized by Christ to uh, the liar who asked him, what are the great, you know, what are the great, what's the most important commandment? And uh, Rabboni, or uh, Rabbi, and, and that's what he said. He, he quoted Deuteronomy, love God with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. And the second one is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. So those Judeo-Christian ethics that our nation was founded on uh, give us the platform, that the best platform for us to, to help each of us keep and protect our rights. So if we were to replace um, the, the first one, love your God, mm-hmm. if, if we took on a more, national, more nationalistic approach and it, we replaced it with love your country and the second one, love your neighbor, do you think that could work if the country or the state wasn't corrupt? If it taught morally acceptable and beneficial? So, so then that that you know that's a that's another podcast there, buddy. But uh, in the 1960s, that's when education kind of started to move away from the emphasis of of Judeo Christian ethics. Uh, uh, also, started to move away from uh, you know. Uh, pledging allegiance to the flag, um, taking Bibles out of schools, taking prayer out of schools, um, and where humanist, secular humanism uh, became on the rise. Um, uh, a lot of it was uh, uh, exacerbated and, and, and fueled by the counterculture that the Vietnam War kind of helped foster. We could get into all the reasons for that. But uh, uh, you, you, if you take uh, ethics... Right, uh, and we we keep coming back to Judeo Christian ethics because it's just fact um, that those were the ethics that our nation was founded upon. Mm-hmm. And so, if you if you really want to, right, some politicians say fundamentally change America, then change the ethics that it was founded upon. And many of them try. Uh, we need to be careful about that because uh, um, the rights that you and I, right, uh, if you love God and you feel like your rights come from God that creates a, a, a dynamic that is unique to America. Other than the um, kind of d- uh, diffusion of the moral aspect and the ethical aspect, is there any other things that you see in today's society that could be a threat to the Republic? Well, Lincoln uh, was quoted, and I'm going to paraphrase, he said that uh, uh, it would never happen that a, a foreign power would ever dip a toe or dip a cup into the Mississippi River. Um, that uh, uh, here again, uh, quoting scripture, uh, "House divided itself cannot stand." Uh, Lincoln was always uh, the big, uh, a big one about uh, uh, stressing that. There is no doubt that uh, <clears throat> our nation is a covenant nation. Um, if you read read uh, President Kennedy's first inaugural address, read read Johnson's inaugural address, read Obama's inaugural address, read Bush's and both of the Bush. You can go back and read several of our modern presidents, and they talk about a national covenant. Um, and the bottom line is, is that uh, uh, the the first covenant society was uh, based uh, with the Israelites, and uh, they had a covenant. And uh, uh, that was the, the, the foundation of their society. 
Um, and the, our founders and the, and the uh, colonists who came here uh, read the Mayfire Compact, may read the earliest documents of the people who came here, uh, whether it was in Jamestown or the pilgrims up in uh, Plymouth. Uh, you read, I mentioned the Mayflower Compact, but there's several others. Uh, they all talk about a, a covenant of, of, of freedom, of uh, ethics that would be shared where we would take care of each other. And, uh, and uh, one of the most important there was the freedom of conscience. And so you can't, uh, uh, to me, it's if you, one of the, the greatest perils is from within, we'll, we'll be the one that messed this up. And Alexander Tyler, I mentioned him briefly in, earlier in the podcast, he said that free people, free societies and governments generally last about 450 years, and then they, they collapse uh, uh, in on themselves. He mentioned the primary reason was uh, financial, because people could realize that they could vote themselves money from the public treasury. And uh, uh, I think that might be a little too simplistic, but uh, I, I think he had history on his side. Um, the great covenant experience uh, experiment of the of our nation, as you know, our, we declared our independence in 1776, but we're maybe a little over halfway towards 450 years, yeah, about 230 something, um, and we have we have growing pains. You know, this uh, uh, you get more and more people, uh, and uh, but but our founding fathers were wise. And they put power in the people, in the government generally closest to you, and, and that there's a layer of safety that if, in whether it's your local government here in Gunnison, your county government, your state government, and there are certain things that states get to regulate that the federal government doesn't because the founding fathers were great historians and they knew the power of human nature and that government likes power and power likes to be concentrated. And uh, once you get a concentration of power, then individual rights suffer. So they've, they've laid the schematic out. It's beautiful. Uh, we then uh, cannot separate all of the work that they did and, and that, we, that our forefathers, all of us did, um, but we can't separate me and you sitting here right now and in our own families, in our own communities, personal responsibility, personal choice. And, uh, you know, as an educator... Uh, you know, I, I, I've enjoyed the opportunity to try and foster those and help kids understand the power of choice, also understand the power of consequence and the, and the force for good that, that uh, we all can be. So um, to me, if we, lose, if we lose those founding principles of personal responsibility and obedience to the unenforceable, um, then you start to you either drift towards anarchy, but Alexander Tyler, in his study uh, back clear back in the 1800s, he said that we will drift to totalitarianism, just like the Romans went from a republic to Julius Caesar. Um, that's that's like the saying of when you know power's taken out, it leaves a power vacuum, and I think that anarchy is just too much of a vacuum because even with anarchy. Someone's like, oh, hey, you know, this is a this is a good place for me to take up and take hold, and eventually you get some kind of totalitarianism. And here again, uh, I don't spend a, a ton of time in urban areas, but let's be honest: in parts of Chicago, it's anarchy. Oh yeah. In parts of Los Angeles, um, um, Skid Row, right? The cops hardly ever go down there. It's uh, it's you know you have a lot of they use the term homeless. Uh, there's there's very little there's very little governing, and but there's very little obedience to the unenforceable either, and um, it's it, so you can see in in, in sh uh, small microcosms the breakdown, and uh, here again the, those are those answers and things would be an entire other podcast, but but for the vast majority of Americans, um, I think we still uh, hold true to that covenant to a degree. Um, and we need to trust ourselves and trust our, our homes, our neighborhoods, our communities, and, and trust those more than, say, politicians. I think you've said it best right there. Um, we are approaching an hour and a half. Is there anything wow, else? that, that went uh, fast. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love being an educator. Um, uh, it's challenging. Uh, it's, it's very rewarding. At times it is heartbreaking. We've, we've kind of covered the, the gamut. Um, it's 
as I look back over uh, 27 years now, it's, uh, it's gone by really fast. And, uh, um, but I think that, uh, you know, as we, we talk about each individual is unique and it comes with special abilities and challenges. The, uh, the fundamental thing in my line of work is if you do what's best for kids, you you rarely go wrong. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes that's not always black and white. And as an administrator now, I find that it's, it's hundreds of shades of gray. So it's, that part is, it's, uh, very challenging, but, uh, you're constantly, you're constantly trying to, uh, uh, meet people's needs and, and, and help them. But, uh, here again, uh, to me, education is about helping kids learn and learning has to be lifelong. And, uh, our content is very, very important. All of our, you know, science, math, but, uh, teaching kids and helping model for kids, uh, good habits where they will be lifelong learners, good communicators and problem solvers. Uh, if we can do that. And then a lot of the other things we've talked about, I think will fall into place. Um, I'm proud to be an American. I love our country. Uh, the teaching history has been a joy. I, I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. As a matter of fact, I think my, my last year in the classroom was your, uh, I believe your junior year mm-hmm. taking U.S. history. And I look back, that was way fond memories. That was a, a great uh, last year to be in the classroom. Um, and uh, our country is not perfect because uh, there is no such thing. There will never be a utopia. But our founding fathers uh, gave us an opportunity. And through uh, through our constitutional protections and through Judeo-Christian ethics and the uh, uh, a good sense of morality to obey the unenforceable, uh, we've got a shot. And we uh, it's it's a generational uh, struggle, and uh, it could be gone in one generation. I firmly believe that. So education is uh, I feel like we're on the front line to help with that, mm-hmm. and as a teamwork with good homes. Um, we, we preserve freedom and we preserve our way of life for at least another generation. I, uh, I have so much to think about right now after all that. That was good, especially the history. I'm going to have to have you on again. We're going to, I'd love to do it. We're just going to have a straight history one. It's three hours of, three hours of nonstop Red Jackson. Get me back on the calendar, buddy. (laughs) Um, no, but I I do think that the uh, students at Gunnison High are really blessed uh, to have someone like you in, in administration and, and I know I was blessed to have you as a, as a teacher. I learned a lot. So well, thank you, Caleb. It's uh, it's uh, it's been 26 years of uh, it's gone by really fast. You know they say time flies when you're having fun, and uh, uh, I don't want to demean it by just saying fun. It's been very rewarding, and uh, I've raised my family here, and so Gunnison's not just a place I work; it's a place I live, and and uh, uh, appreciate it to, as a community helping to help me raise my family and and uh, here again hopefully my kids pick up the torch and and carry that uh, that uh, american covenant forward and uh, i love gunnison valley high school i love our community so it's a it's a pleasure to be here and talk with you and to have shared some of those experiences hey thank you so much Rhett. thank you caleb